Welcome all. Scholarly research can be presented at the annual conference or submitted to the MHA journal. Uh, MHA Nuggets is for the lighter side of research. It's for the interesting stuff you run across that doesn't fit into the conference or the journal. So if you have any ideas and would like to present something to MHA Nuggets, just let me know. When I scheduled this series of MHA Nuggets for the next four months, I wanted a topic to advertise. And since time was so short, I thought I would do something and remembered I had a list of Denver Club members that I had made up while researching my great-grandfather, William F. Patrick. I presented an overview of the mining lives of William and his brothers at the 2016 Telluride Conference, and we'll tell you all about the brothers' mining adventures in Nevada this coming June. The Denver Club was established in 1880 to give the male movers and shakers of Colorado a place to socialize and do business. It was modeled on the Gentlemen's Clubs of London, and no expense was spared to impress uh, guests about the wealth and culture of Denver. The club first rented rooms at the Windsor Hotel and then moved into the renovated Guards Hall. By 1885, the members had bigger ideas, and a purpose-built clubhouse was built on the corner of 17th and Glenarm. It was finished in 1888. There were 17 sleeping rooms on the third floor and a ladies' dining room in the basement, along with the barbershop, bowling alley, gymnasium, and laundry. Men only until 1978. Women were only allowed in the visitors' lounge on the first floor and the ladies' dining room. The members received a little red book with the rules of the club. No gambling, no dogs, no taking excuse me, no talking in the library, no pipe smoking. Only whist was allowed as a friendly game with no gambling involved. These men did their gambling in a big way in mines, smelters, railroads, property development, and utilities. Initiation fee was $100 and the annual dues was $80. By 1885, they had 218 members. The club aimed to have a total of 500 members 300 resident, that is living in Denver, and 200 non-resident, anywhere more than 10 miles away from Denver, including other places in Colorado, the U.S., and even a few members from Great Britain. This is the list I made from the Denver Club Annuals at the Pu Denver Public Library. He started publishing in 1885, so this, this list really only shows members who may have lived in Leadville between 1885 and 1890. As with any city or business directory, residency in the locality can only be an approximation due to the vagaries of data collection in a pre-digital world. The books also listed the year of initiation into the club, which is that column of years there. There are 35 non-resident members listed as living in Leadville at some point during the six years. There are several well-known businessmen who did live in Leadville at one time or another, but are not on the list. Horace Tabor was a founding member of the Denver Club and a founding member of Leadville, but he is not on the list probably because he was, our, he was living in Denver uh, by 1885. Charles Betcher made his money with hardware stores, first in Greeley, then Fort Collins, then Boulder, before moving to Leadville in 1878. He moved to Denver in 1890, and perhaps that's when he finally joined the club. James Grant attended the School of Mines at Freiburg, Germany, and built an early smelter in Leadville. He moved to Denver in 1882 after his marriage and built the Omaha and Grant smelter uh, north of Denver. The Omaha and Grant smelter was thought to be the largest smelter in the world at the time. It closed in 1903, and the buildings were gradually torn down over many years, finally just leaving the stack standing, and it was demolished in 1950 to make way for the Denver Coliseum. Grant also served as Colorado governor, 1883, to 1885. 
here's an expanded list. And I was looking uh, to see when these men arrived in Colorado and from where, I mean, arrived in Leadville and from where. However, a lot of that information I just could not find, if, you know, unless I had a really good uh, biography of them. And then not many of these men did leave biographies that were published, published anyway. The names in the light blue are names found in the 1879 Leadville directory. That gave me some uh, indication of profession for most of these men. And I also used the wonderful history of Leadville by Don and Jean Griswold. The two volume set published by the Colorado Historical Society is just simply awesome. They went through all the newspapers in Leadville they could get their hands on and wrote a 12 pound year by year history of Leadville. It is a must for anyone doing research on Leadville in the 19th century. The arrival years beginning with the word by are the years the men were first mentioned in the newspapers and reported by the Griswolds. So it's very possible that they had been in Leadville before then, but I have no uh, indication of when that could be. Of course, most of these men held more than one job or position, oftentimes concurrently. So I've put down the most frequent or notable line of occupation or I just picked one and put it down. Mining engineer or mine manager is the most numerous. As most of you know, mining engineer was a loose title used by men who held actual degrees in mining or civil engineering and those who thought they earned the title through experience. Many mine managers were engineers, but many weren't, and I have no way of telling if it just said that they managed so-and-so mine. So I put them all together in blue. Smelting in orange came next with six people, with six men, then banking in green. Oh, then, uh, excuse me. Then law in, in purple and banking in green. Of course, many miners also tried their hand at banking, but banking in the 19th century proved to be just as fickle as mining in bestowing and taking money. I'll get to the individuals soon, but I wanted to make some observations about the whole group. In going through the list, it seems that the Civil War was a thing of the past. There were men who fought on either side during the war and then were able to work and socialize together in Leadville. Political party affiliation also didn't seem to affect business and, and socializing. Republicans and Democrats are both on the list. The one thing they had in common was being Protestant, although it'd be hard to spot Catholics by name alone. When church affiliation was mentioned in newspaper articles, they were the Protestant churches. One thing I wanted to spot or to find was somebody who worked his way up, you know, from the, from the very bottom and, you know, made a lot of money and was accepted into society. But that did not happen. Um, so several of these men did start off poor, but by the time they came to Leadville, they had already made some money and easily fit into polite society. And this list of people uh, going through the accounts uh, in the Griswold histories, they're always in the same parties and mentioned at the same social events over and over again. This is a fairly tight group, although there were also um, subgroups. In looking at the uh, individuals on the list, oh, I wanted to go back. Um, there are two names in red, Kearney and Morrison. These two were originally members, uh, original members of the Denver Club in 1880. However, they didn't really have much effect on life in Leadville. They I believe probably had very established careers and then came to uh, came to Leadville uh, to practice as lawyer, uh, Morrison as a lawyer and then judge. He was back in Denver by the time he was a judge. Uh, Kearney was brought up 
as a uh, smelt, had already had smelting experience to uh, manage the Leadville gold and silver smelter. Uh, then I also have under the years 1890 over there, there's uh, two gentlemen who were in Leadville from the very beginning, but who did not enter the Denver club until 1890, very late. Uh, it took them 10 years to get there. And I would dearly love to know why, uh, because uh, they were both very prominent citizens all through this time. And I thought, and were friends and even related to several other members, but they didn't join until 1890. Uh, you've got Franklin Ballou there at the top. He came from Georgetown in 1879. Uh, he built a, one of the first smelters or, or managed one of the first smelters in Leadville. And by 1890, Franklin had ret retrofitted his smelter to process mangan manganiferous iron ore that was keeping Leadville alive at that point in time. The other man is uh, Roswell Goodell. Goodell. Uh, Mr. Goodell has, was uh, very well liked and respected. He was born in Connecticut in 1825 and was one of, if not the oldest man on the list. He grew up in Illinois. His father died when he was 15 and he worked uh, on a farm to support the family. And then finally he made it into a general store in Chicago. And from there he um, had held several political positions and mercantile positions. He served in the American, in the Mexican American War in the Illinois Volunteers and helped reorganize the Illinois Volunteers for the Civil War. He was treasurer and then director of the Chicago and Alton Railroad, and he placed the first order for a Pullman coach. He lost most of his money in the 1871 Chicago fire, but started up again immediately as president of the fourth National Bank of Chicago. He moved to Leadville in 1878 and made money through investments in civic projects. One of his daughters married John B. Grant just before he became governor. Now, the man I found most intriguing was the man on the right, Charles L. Hall. He was raised in, Ohio, in Iowa and first tried to mill flour, but found that unprofitable. He moved to Colorado in 1859 to raise cattle but soon sold out and moved up to California Gulch on December 14, 1859. He was moderately successful and moved on to the San Juans and other mining camps in Colorado. In February 1861, Hill was pros prospecting with two other miners between the Animas and Uncompadre rivers when they got lost and ran out of food. They boiled and ate their buckskin pants and buffalo robe. At one point, Hill suspected the other two of planning to kill and eat him, a la Alfred Packer. And so he got away from them at night. A day later, one of the men caught up with him and asked to travel with Hill because he feared the third man was going to kill and eat him. So Hill and this other uh, man continued on together. Finally, at the end, crawling on their hands and knees, making about a mile a day until another mining party heard the pistol they had fired and found them. During the 14-day ordeal, Hall had lost 48 pounds. He returned to the safety of California Gulch and continued to prospect. He also crossed over the mountain range to Fair Play, and in the spring of 62, he found some salt springs 20 miles from Fair Play and started the Colorado Salt Works. Hall's descendants still run the cattle ranch that includes what remains of the salt work buildings. Um, I think I do remember seeing this in South Park. And that stack stood until the mid-1990s when after 
Over a hundred years of cattle rubbing up against it, it finally weakened and fell over. Um, call, uh, Hall represented Park, represented Park County in the territorial legislature and was county commissioner uh, and was county commissioner. In 1878, he moved to Leadville and started a business uh, grading the streets and laying pipes. He started the Leadville Illuminating Gas Company with Horace Tabor and William Bush. In 1881, his successful mining career began with the purchase of the Milo Group of Mines in the 10 Mile District, north of Leadville. In 1892, he went to Arizona and discovered the Mammoth Mine, and he continued to mine and ranch in both Arizona and Colorado. Um, another member, John Hardy, uh, was a coal merchant. And this seems to be the um, most, the dirtiest job of any of the uh, Denver Club members. Uh, however, I can't, uh, of the three John Harveys I could find in the Leadville directories for this time, um, John Harvey, the coal my, uh, merchant, uh, seemed to be the most prosperous. So I guess this is the, him. Uh, this is John Harvey here in, uh, in the doorway. I also have a strong suspicion that John Harvey was the great, is the grandfather of Gene Harvey Griswold, who wrote these wonderful histories too. Another member was Edward R. Holden. Um, he was a smelter man and was brought in by Guggenheim first into Leadville to help with the AY and mini mines. And then later uh, he joined with the Guggenheims and started the Philadelphia Smelting and Refining Company and built, went down and built their smelter in Pueblo. He event also then went up to Denver and built the Globe Smelter. And they're just finally now erasing the last traces of the globe smelter in, in that area of Denver. The um, National Western Stock Show is being redeveloped. And the globe smelter was just on the northern end of where they're, uh, they're working on the stock, uh, the stockyards. As for my great-grandfather, William F. Patrick, he owned and managed the Colonel Sellers Mine. These white buildings here in the front are Guggenheim's AY and Mini Mine Complex. These back here, the dark buildings, are the Colonel Sellers Complex. I believe that house back there shaft house back there is the accident no yeah is the accident and the head frame is still uh, you can still see it on iron hill in california gulch today uh, this is just uh, the picture on the right is just uh, another picture of the colonel sellers from a different direction this mining complex here in the front is the Haunted Moyers Mine. Um, they were said at one point to have at least three ghosts roaming uh, around the adits and, and uh, moving things around. But getting back to the Denver Club, by the mid-1950s, the club members were thinking that their lovely clubhouse was a bit old and dowdy and they wanted something new and exciting. So in 1954, they built Denver's first skyscraper. And this is the building that replaced that lovely old building that somebody uh, decided that they should call Cherry Creek Romanesque. And that is the end. We're back here to the list if 
anybody has any questions. I just learned something new. Oh? I, that uh, the anthracite coal in Colorado. I was just looking on my phone and it was in Crested Butte. And also some that was not mined at the time out in uh, way up in Northwest Colorado. But so I didn't realize that anthracite coal was found in Colorado. Uh, Eric can tell, tell us more about that, but there was coal all around Colorado. Yeah, but anthracite is pretty oh. rare. Oh, okay. Any other questions or comments? I have another one. Um, since these rich men in Denver are listed in the newspapers at all these social events, same names, have you run into any thing where their children like married one another in baltimore you had the uh, bachelor's cotillion and the debutantes and the coming outs and all that other stuff and all the same families were in the same social events and then of course the children were intermarrying so i was just wondering like, if, if any daughter of some one denver mining magnet married another anything a son of, or anything like that if, yeah you know, Yeah, Clemens cutting in here. I understand that, that uh, the uh, Crested Butte anthracite, that's the biggest pocket anthracite in the West, as I recall. And of course, now uh, Crested Butte's a big ski resort, and they're, they're shocked by the notion of mining going on anywhere in the area. <laughs> Hold on just a second. The 1950s building is still existing uh, yes it is as a matter of fact oh, you take this outside how's it being used um yeah it um the building is still there it, in 1997 it was redeveloped and the the denver club had only the first top two floors and they were they were uh trying to um keep the club going um but anyway okay getting back to marriage yes they did um roswell goodall came to leadville with five daughters um as i said he married one off to uh john grant john b grant who immediately became governor although i don't think getting married had much to do with becoming governor um, but also A.A. A. Blow married another of Goodell's uh, daughters. Um, let's see. And I think there's one other intermarriage, and I can't remember who, who it was that marries whose sister. Um, but there was some of that also. Nice. Any other questions? Barbara, is there uh, information that you picked up along the way about uh, what these gentlemen did in their club? What, what was it like to spend an evening or an afternoon at the club? Okay. Um, well, your typical uh, male club thing. Uh, <laughs> Uh -oh. Drones Club. <laughs> uh, I did find a master thesis uh, from 1972 on the history of the uh, Denver Club. And the, uh, the writer uh, spent like the first third of her thesis imagining the day of that David Moffat would have. He, he lived just a block or two away and the club was situated between his house and his office. So evidently he would go over, get his shoes shined, get a shave, have breakfast, go to his club, come back, 
talk to people, socialize, maybe have dinner if he didn't have to go out to a party with his wife or anything. Um, but it was the, the, the tri uh, traditional uh, club. They had, they could talk in the, the dining room. Evidently they had, there was in the middle of the room, there was one huge round table where the, the elite of the club would meet. And evidently it was at this table during the 1880s, even into the 1890s, when um, on various days, the, all the Republicans would get together and decide who was going to run for which office. And then another day, the, the, the Democrats would get together and decide who was going to run and win for, for which office. Um, otherwise, they would uh, all get together or these men would get together and decide the future of Denver and Colorado. Um, there was no talking in the library, so they could go in and have a nap or read the newspapers and catch up. And like I said, there's 17 rooms on the third floor, uh, mainly for the non-resident members so when they came into Denver to do business they could stay there instead of at a at a hotel and of course if they had any business people come in from outside of Denver they can impress them by having them stay there at the club mm -hmm. but they were supposed to have a very very good chef were they were they serious about their library or was that a library mostly in name only do we know what the collections were or if there was a no, collection. I don't. I I I think it was probably more of a a library for being quiet and reading newspapers and, and magazines, happening. probably. Johnny, did you hear my bit about uh, uh, Crested Butte? Yes. And um, how did they get the coal from Crested Butte side of the mountain range over around to Leadville? What's the rail line, or do they have to cart it over the, what is that, Independence Pass or something? No, I'm going to have to look that up. They, they went all the way south, as I recall. They went from Crested Butte down to, uh, through, uh, um, maybe it was Antonito. I'm going to have to look at that on the map in terms of that. Um, but, yeah, that's, as I, as I say, I think that's the, the biggest pocket of anthracite in the West. Colorado's overwhelmingly subbituminous. Um, so, yeah, how that got there, who the hell knows, but, but uh but uh, it was worked. The CF and I, of course, was very much interested in it because it went right into their uh, their steel making operations. Um, but uh, mostly they were uh, coking, of course, uh, subbituminous into coke. And the railroad was into Leadville proper by eighty one. Look that up. I'll be right back. <laughs> as as I was more concerned about the when the railroad crested it to. To, from further west to come back to Leadville, I, I just can't, I can't picture it. Unless the, the railroad went across where the Route 50 goes across from Salida over and then around. Okay. Um, I'm not sure of the timing. Um, it came through Canyon City west um oh to salida then north yeah north from salida on up the valley there uh then into the arkansas valley yeah up the arkansas valley from salida north right but that you got a huge mountain range over, yeah. over wasn't, the there, wasn't there a train, a, a railroad that went on, south of Monarch Pass from the Salida area over to Gunnison? The must, it must, that must be it somehow. I think so. I'd have to look at a map too, but I'm sure there was, was a railroad line that kind of paralleled Monarch Pass. Yeah, they certainly, it, this thing says they had a, a railroad depot in Crested Butte of the Denver and Rio Grande in 1883. So that means they made it around all around the same time and so they could bring coal back yeah 
I'd have to look at the map. <laughs> yeah, the, the railroad from uh, the south came into Leadville in 82, just in time for, I think they just finished it in time for Grant when he came to visit Leadville. When, when, when was he in Leadville? What? When was he in Leadville? 82. In 82. Hmm. Sherman visited also. Oscar Wilde, 82, 83. It was, it was a busy little time once they finally got their railroad in. You've got maps? Yeah, let's see here. Oh. Eric's checking his railroad maps on that. Oh, doggone it. Can't see well enough to see it anymore. Does Eric have his engineer cap on? No, yeah. not right now. It's <laughs> Crested Butte. I can't find Crested Butte. He says this was 83. I was going to say 81 somewhere in there, but yeah, it's 81, 82. There, there was the, there's a great spurt of railroad building sort of uh, in the early 1880s and they got to there. But where is it? But yeah, the most of the, the, the people on, on this list, you know, they did have, they supported, like I said, um, the op, Tabor's Opera Company. and. Oh, Eric found a map. Um, so it, the, you're right. The, it came Canyon City and up to Leadville. And, of course, then it continued on and, and met with that other branch up at Glenwood Springs. But then a branch from Slida went over near Monarch Pass. There it is. Yeah, I have it. It it's went up the anthracite side of Crescent Butte, and it continued on to Montrose and then joined up down at Grand Junction. So th 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 they made it further than I realized. I yeah, think. the uh, the Salida business is actually over Marshall Pass, was the, was the railroad pass, which you can still take in a four-wheel drive, by the way. It's a dirt road. Uh, the Monarch Pass is the highway. Yeah, I was looking too far south. And so then it's, uh, yeah, basically it's just dead north of Gunnison. So they get to Gunnison, and then they go, uh, they go uh, Crescent Butte is north of there. And I don't see what the completion date is, but this map is 1883 and it's on there. That's what they said the year they built the depot was 1883. So yeah, essentially it's uh, it's just uh, it's just uh, whatever it is. How many miles here? Where's the key? Um, it's not too far north of Gunnison. So yeah, and of course in those days the uh, the Salida to uh, the Canyon City to Salida to Gunnison to to Montrose to the Grand Junction was the main line, of course. This all predates the Moffat uh, Tunnel and all that. So in those days, that was the east-west main line for the Rio Grande, all the way to narrow gauge. So coal question. Uh, is all the front range coal then bituminous? Basically. Yeah, there's two big blocks of it. One is, is uh, in the area around Trinidad that you saw. And the other one, of course, is the Boulder, the Boulder fields, uh, the Coal Creek Canyon fields. Marshall, which is just south of Boulder, and and uh, what else is out there? Well, all, you know, Louisville, Lafayette, um, um, what else is out there? Erie uh, has, Erie, has a Firestone, with Frederick. Extent. Yeah. And then uh, there's a, there's also a small deposit in Colorado Springs, a place called Pikeview there, hmm. uh, which is just north of, uh, now it's in Colorado Springs. In those days, it would have been, you know, 10 miles north of downtown Colorado Springs. Were the Coalfield Wars all just front range, so just bituminous? Yeah, that's that's going on, uh, and essentially around, that's the fields around Trinidad, right? Mm -hmm. Ludlow is, as you remember, is near Hastings and all of that, where we went, and it's it's uh, what is that like seventeen miles north of Trinidad, I think it is, something like that. So it wasn't the Coalfield uh, Wars weren't statewide. Well, uh, everybody's got their discontents. There's another uh, a place, a place called the Columbine Mine, which is the northern field. There was another confrontation, and, and uh, uh, miners got killed by by guards in, in what is that, 1922, somewhere in there. Where's Columbine again? Where's the mine is not uh, the mine is fading. But uh, so yeah, there was the, the the big one, the Ludlow, and all of that is in the southern fields. But there was uh, plenty of discontents 
certainly in different parts of the where, state. Where is the Columbine mine? That's up in uh, up northern get up, she says, get up. That's, yeah, that's around, uh, um, um, sort of near Louisville, Lafayette, isn't it? Here. Okay, so, so yeah. more front range. Yeah, yeah. It's, in, it's in the northern field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Crested Butte's weird. Crested Butte's just kind of out there by itself. And of course, the other thing they had at Crested Butte was molybdenum, right? <laughs> As I recall. So th there was mining up there. And of course, now it's been it's been discovered by the Californians who are, of course, as I mentioned, horrified by any suggestion that you do mining in the region, which is interesting because it's a mining, there's, there's mining people, town. There's, there's people from New York moving to Crested Butte now. Oh, yeah. Out of New York. Yeah. Yeah, it's all been discovered. Lucky us. People are from New York are moving everywhere but New York. <laughs> yeah, but there are a lot of them are moving to Crested Butte. Well, I was at a buddy up in Pocatello, Idaho. This would have been 20 years ago. And he said the Californians had discovered Pocatello. And when they've discovered Pocatello, it's checkmate. You know, it's, it's over at that point. They've discovered everything. Great exoduses of New York and California. Well, ha housing is still housing construction is still booming near where I work. Well, I work mostly from home, but in Pennsylvania, because people are fleeing all the cities, and so it's driving up the suburbs and the rural slash suburbs. And housing's booming because they just people just don't want to be anywhere near the the social unrest in the cities. On the East Coast. Yes, I guess I guess Colorado real estate. Ms. Ms. Sylvia can tell us more about this, but but Colorado real estate is way up now that we want to move back and, and buy in. Of course, the, the prices are going up. So I've I've heard that, but my neighborhood isn't hasn't increased. So uh, come and move near us. Howdy, howdy neighbor. That's why we're, you know, we've saved a little money, so we're thinking, you know, the cardboard box under the freeway overpass of our dreams is is within reach here. So, don't they call that gentr? They call that gentrification. That's right. Uh, yeah. I must be the gentry. Well, apparently, land is the new hot investment, and uh, who was it? I was reading about the other day. Is it the uh, the gates? Gates is now the largest single agricultural landowner in the world. Oh, I saw yeah, that. I saw that. Yeah. Well, this was, uh, yeah, this has Western precedence. There was a 20 years or 30 years ago now, there was a joking reference. They used to call it Mon Turner because Ted Turner owned about half of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We actually were marooned at one point. I think you were there on that trip, Barbara and I. We were over the, we were over the uh, I-25 over Raton Pass into uh, into Raton there, and and the, they got white out on the highway, so we're sort of stuck in the gas station there. We're kind of shipwrecked for two hours or whatever it was, waiting for the traffic to start moving again. And we're just sitting there reading and listening, and it was the locals talking about it. And frankly, they're a little worried because Ted Turner's buying up all the land around Raton, which is great for Ted Turner, but Ted Turner isn't buying his caviar local. He's, he's flying it in. You know, and, and so they were really worried. These people in these convenience stores and whatnot were really worried about well, when, when he owns everything around us, what happens to the business? You know, it's going to be the freeway or nothing because the ranches yeah. are being bought out and so forth and so on. So this well, is Lynn is fish, Lynn is fly fished on uh, Turner's ranches out in Montana. So, yeah, yeah, this is he was at one point, I think he was the largest landholder in Montana. Yep, yep. There's a, there's a guy that there's a a historian is actually at uh, um, at uh, Durango named Andrew Gulliford, and he wrote a book called Boomtown Blues. It was about the uh, the attempt to do oil shale on the western slope of Colorado in the 1980s, yep. and how Exxon came in and they were going to you know do all this oil shale. This was fracking before there was fracking, uh, and then they pulled out because they realized it wasn't economically viable because of water and things like that. And, and uh, uh, Gulliford wrote this book sort of as the young uh, graduate student burning with anger about how how uh, Exxon had you know brought this in and then and then uh, had pulled the plug on it and so forth so boom and bust and all that but he, he, re, he the book was reissued in 2005 and it has an interesting updated forward in it in which Gulliford says yeah okay I was a little hot in this and you know I, I've learned to sort of pace myself a little better in terms of that but he also was kind of poignant about he talked about it turns out you know maybe it makes some sense to have some industry uh, in your economy because what you got now out there is you've got um 
it's all absentee multimillionaire types and, and the minimum wage types that support this system. There's no, there's no middle to it anymore. It's, it's all sort of the, again, it's the, the people that are dominating the community aren't there all the time because they're, they're, you know, back at their, uh, at their winter homes or whatever. Uh, and then it's people sort of scratching to get by. Uh, and his thought Back to was, the medieval system. Yeah, his thought was an interesting one, which is, you know, say what you like or don't like about industry. It provides at least some kind of a middle level of the economy for people. People make decent wages and, and, and so forth. And, and uh, he said, in retrospect, you know, maybe it would have been made some sense to keep a little industry on the Western slope. Well, we're, we're just about to end this. Hey, <laughs> Ed, just hey, Ed. <laughs> it, before we get too far along with this uh, and lose track, thank you, Barb, for your presentation. Yes. That was very oh, interesting. Good. Yes. Yep. Yes. Thank you. It was a treat. And like I say, if anybody else has anything, there you are. Stan. <laughs> they just pop in. <laughs> Hello, Stan. Hi, Stan. Oh, well, there's Stan Dempsey. Hi, Stan. Um, we're just hey. leave. Could, could I interject uh, something a little off topic? I, I, I meant to say something during our socializing, but I completely forgot. But if it's getting late, I, I'll put it aside. No, that's okay. <laughs> I, I, just a, a little example of how uh, mining history can in, intrude into every day. Uh, this morning, I got a, a Facebook post from a completely unrelated source uh, posted by a, a scuba diver who back in the 1980s uh, discovered a shipwreck in Lake Michigan. And he posted a photograph of a bunch of lead ingots that he claimed to have recovered off the shipwreck. Now the shipwreck went down in 1895 and at least some of these lead ingots bore a smelter mark from a smelter that I tracked down in Dubuque in the Dubuque area that ran from 1845 to 1871. And it seemed very improbable to me that, um, that uh, pig lead from a uh, smelter that had be been defunct for almost 25 years had gone down on a shipwreck in Lake Michigan in 1895. It also was a schooner and, and it seemed unlikely that a schooner would be carrying a a centerboard schooner would be carrying a heavy load of, of pig lead. So, uh, you know, the wheel started turning and I started making some inquiries. And as it turned out, um, we've tracked down on the smelters involved and they, they all were pre-Civil War, pretty much pre-Civil War operations. And we also tracked down, tracked down a, a guy that was an active scuba diver back in the 1960s who claims to have recovered literally tons of pig lead from a different shipwreck uh, about a mile away. And uh, it's fascinating because he sold off all of that lead that he uh, recovered. And it apparently made, made it into the hands of this guy that claims to have discovered it on the other shipwreck. So we haven't completely entangled it, but um, that's the kind of thing that can pop up out of nowhere. <laughs> I've got two of our foremost uh, shipwreck experts, including the state underwater archaeologists chasing this down, and they're all excited about it now. So we'll see what happens, but it's kind of interesting. Hi, Stan. I'm sorry, but you're about an hour late. Oh, you're just at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're at the end, but um, you can catch the, the replay on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and my son Stan Jr. I like said to too. Yeah, I had it down as me at this time, so I must be an hour off of your time. Okay. Yeah. It. It. Where are you located? I forget. I'm in Golden, Colorado. Okay, Golden. So it's going to be at six o'clock your time. Okay. Yeah, it starts at seven o'clock Central. Okay, but it, uh, it it's been over now. Yeah. I've already given the presentation. Oh, well, you could do it again. <laughs> I'll bring the sandwiches and the beer. Okay. <laughs> we'll be there. Okay, well, I'll, I'll tune out then. I'm sorry I missed it. But, uh, 
Enjoy okay, seeing okay. But well, thank you all for coming. And okay. I hope to see you all next next month. I hope so. Bye bye. Okay. Thanks, bye. Good bye to bye. see everybody. Take care. It was a thank treat. you. See okay. Ya. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>